All right, you guys, welcome back to another episode of The Common Theory. And today we have some very, very, very cool things for you guys today. But first, let's get to these introductions so you guys understand how exciting I am, well, how excited I am, how, like, I don't even got words, I'm pumped, I'm ready. Like, so let me get some introductions out of the way. But of course, as always, my man Puzzle Box is with me. Puzzle, how are you doing, my bro? I'm doing pretty good. Ended up topping that Yu-Gi-Oh! Regional, so that was fun. Um, yes. Now we're Exciting. back on the grind. Yes, yes. But of course, let's introduce our special guest for this evening, the most recent tournament winner, Mizu, my bro. Please introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm Mizu San. I'm a PDH player that plays mainly in Sanctuary, but I'm starting to branch off into some other things. Uh, recently, I won Common Cause 2 on Scholar of Ages in a uh, really, really good tournament. All for charity. Well, thank you so much for that, my bro. And of course, you guys can see now why I'm just so pumped. I'm excited. Uh, we're actually going to be able to talk about Mizu. Um, specifically, the best part about this is that we're going to be delving in thoughts that Mizu specifically would like to talk about. So this isn't something that, like, you know, we're going to be picking and choosing. We're actually going to be delving within the mind of Mizu and discussing really specific topics and really talking, you know, about the deck that they played and the tournament as a whole, but really a subject that I really think needs to be said. And I'm very excited to speak about this as a whole. And I'm very excited to hear the thoughts that Mizu has, especially the fact that, you know, they played a deck that is very good at doing this. So, uh, Puzzle, do you want to kind of start us off or you want me to start us off or what you got? Um, I'm fine with whatever. Does <laughs> Mizu have a, a specific point we want to start with first? Let Mizu take the wheel, perhaps? <laughs> yeah. So, for me, one of the the very important things that you can pull point out in that tournament is the fact that tap out on any point in the mid game is very very dangerous. Yes, especially in big pods full of combo players. Well, okay, yeah. So hang on, real quick before we keep going in that one statement, right? The mid game has changed, right? Like we all can kind of say that, like. A year ago, mid game was turn ten and twelve, right? Mid game now is turn five. So, turn four, like five, maybe even six if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky, right? So, you saying mid game in this day and age is much different than the years past. So, I just wanted to kind of elaborate that with you guys because turns have decreased and decreased and decreased. And old thoughts about Scholar of Ages was, I uh, grind you into the dust, turn 15, I'm going to dramatic revol reversal you. That is not what Mizu did in this event, so <laughs> let, us, let us know how you won, bro. So, uh, both in round one and the finals, I had a really early win. I believe turn five in the first round, and then in the finals was a turn six, both off of high tights. Turns out, doubling all of your mana is really, really good. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing that I I did want to touch on just for your list. Um, looking at the mana base, your mana base is how many islands? 32 basic islands and one mystic sanctuary. So, uh, high tide... That is also an island. Yeah, uh, turns out high tide's really good whenever you're mono blue and you can afford to play literally all islands, and you will never have a land that's tapped unless you get really screwed over with exactly Mystic Sanctuary early and no other lands, I guess. And every land drop enables high tide. So that's one thing that I just wanted to point out that I thought was really interesting with your list. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Well, the mana base makes it really easy to just not have to worry about tap lands, have to worry about colors. I can just focus on making sure that I use my mana as effectively as I can every turn. 
Yeah, ex exactly. So, like, one of the things I like to say is uh, it, it's smooth brain, which I understand that's not really the proper way to say it. It's just kind of the way I relate it to myself. But it gives you the ability to actually care more about your play patterns because you actually never have to truly pay attention to your mana base, which is fantastic in these styles of decks. That's kind of why we've even done it on our tier list, the whole holy trinity of these monocolor decks, because the mana bases are so clean and so efficient that it's it's fantastic. But the biggest thing, so back to you, Mizu, and back to the tapping out subject. With this mid-game premise, right, of not tapping out, if the table has chosen to tap out in turn, let's just go four, five, and six. Those are like the best lines that your deck could perform, right? The longer, the better. What do you yeah. think... What would be, like, the reason? Why is the table even tapping out against you, right? Like, what are your thoughts on that as a whole in that subject, the tapping out, right? The whole table's tapping out against you seems somewhat absurd, in a sense. Like, what could it even be doing, right? So I know one of them is a big one that uh, not know no turn, certain decks start to run and start to threaten with their wins every turn. So mm -hmm. a deck like which around turn five or turn six begins to threaten the combo every turn. If you've never played against Scholar, then you're not sure what turn that's off at. Uh, another reason is if you are a deck that needs a secondary engine and you're having a bad game. We saw this mm -hmm. in the finals with Ryan having to tap out to play TPI because the way that he wins that game is by TPI being on the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, no, oh, take, take it over. Puzzle. Those are the two biggest reasons. <laughs> I was just going to point out, like, not only is there a bit of the rogue factor um, where, you know, people don't know what it does, which is more common in our format than most, I'd say, just because of, like, how diverse the meta is sometimes and everyone just plays whatever they want, really. Um, but also, like, if you don't know Scholar and you look at it and you see seven mana... There's, yeah, there's just, like, no way you're ever going to expect it to be winning on turn four or turn five, right? Like, how are they yeah, even going to cast it, much less win the game? <laughs> um, yeah, it's like a running joke, right? Like, <laughs> it's like seven mana. This is stone cold and playable. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll wait till turn eight. Yeah, my commander. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, the, the tapping out... I mean, that was presented within the tournament with you. Um, even, you know, that final showed it kind of like you said, right? One player was uh, trying to develop their engine and kept trying to turn their engine on, but were unable to, which gave you a window. And your window was win the game. Unlike many of the mid-range strategies we have of the format, where it's like develop this engine to continue to push forward, Your your engine is winning the game, which I think kind of needs to be pointed out, right? Like, I mean, I think you and Puzzle have a lot in common with the high tide thing here with uh, Gretchen and Scholar, but I don't know if you guys would like to kind of touch on that one a little bit. Well, Gretchen has a very different way of having its game, uh, what's the word? able to see when it's coming it's a mm -hmm. lot less often that you're going to look at a gretchen game and see oh they're just going to combo out of nowhere usually they have an untapper that has been on the board for a turn i think the only line if uh if i'm correct puzzle is like a boro breeze caller um, that can just win out of nowhere it depends on the build um in the main build that I have, there's a Boro, and then there's also a Strider Harness if you need to give haste to an untapper. Um, well, usually, but some well, builds play like see Strider Harness. Yeah, it it really depends. Either that or I have like 30 mana. Um but there are also versions that uh rely on some old tech from like 
the Weavers, where they play, like, turning lands into creatures, and then just putting the uh, Freed from the Real or Untapper directly onto the land itself. And those can be more explosive, yeah. although substantially more risky. But, uh, yeah, typically the High Tide lines are much less potent in Gretchen for exactly the reason we were talking about earlier. Gretchen has to play forests and dual lands that are not islands, so it's a lot more investment with less payoff on the high tide line compared to Scholar. Yeah. Yeah. With Gretchen, it's a lot more uh, projected. That was the word I was looking for earlier, of when they're going to try to go for it. With Scholar, you just have to hope that they don't have high tide or pay attention to what they're tutoring because scholar can just say oh i've drawn high tide this turn this is the turn where okay. most of gretchen lines are i have an untapper that survived the turn cycle yeah well i mean it's it's kind of funny right like you kind of alluded and well not alluded but you actually spoke about earlier like one of the funniest things you can have with a deck like this is all you need is counter and cantrips right like that's awesome and that's all scholar is right just dig find it win the game and it's absolutely amazing and it was it's very cool to see someone like you winning this because you know it's a uh, actually you and uh clay had spoken about that in your interview how you were once upon a time kind of this casual i mean you're still like this iconic casual player and now you're over here and you're just cracking skulls in the competitive side of the spectrum <laughs> so it's it's very exciting to see that as a whole and you know be right here with you and seeing it and experiencing it so it's it, it's very exciting but sorry for my small tangent there but let me ask you this question the purpose how do you feel about the deck as a whole? Like, I really want to kind of pick your brain, talk to you about it, you know, let everybody know your thoughts on the deck. You know, you spoke with Clay, and, it, you know, we actually, let me, one more little tangent, and we'll get to this. Um, if you don't know, Mizu and Clay over on cpdh.guide had a very good interview over there about, you know, Mizu as a whole the gameplay, and a lot of other things like that. So we're trying to avoid a lot of the things that they spoke about there and kind of go into a different subject over here. So, but with that said, the purpose, like what makes you like the deck? Like, why are you picking certain cards and things of that nature? Like, why is the deck even good? How about that? Like, why is it good? Like, why would you even play this deck? Like, what would you do to recommend this to a new player or even someone at an LGS take this to a tournament? So the reason I picked up the deck was I am a huge fan of High Tide. I have played High Tide combos in EDH, and I've been forcing that strategy for as long as I've played Commander. So Scholar seems like one of the better High Tide variants because it lets me play some of my favorite cards in any of the weird effects that let you do something and then untap a land. Frantic Search being probably one of my favorite blue cards. Uh, the deck is really resilient because it's really hard to get rid of the pieces without Scholar just saying, oh, let me grab them back with my commander. It's resilient. It lets you cantrip and draw through the deck so that you can always kind of stockpile answers. It also really is effective at control the table enough to where it's not dead, but it also lets everyone now care about each other. You're never the scariest player at the table until you grab high tide. Yep. It's very fair. It's very fair. Like, it's, it's interesting because uh, Puzzle said it earlier that the deck is it's a seven mana commander, so it's for newer players, it's very hard to see why this is somewhat good, right? Because we have Archaeomancer, which is four mana. 
So this at seven man, it's very somewhat difficult to kind of read the room when you look at a scholar of ages. But personally, I believe that, you know, your demonstration throughout the event and um, am I wrong, Mizu? Maybe you can help me with this one. I don't know if you've looked back and seen it. Did um, Chris's event, is the VOD up yet or? I'm not sure if the VOD is up yet. I don't okay. think it is. No? Okay. But it, it, I'm assuming it's supposed to be. So if it is, go back, watch me zoo, watch the finals. Awesome. Yeah. Definitely watch the finals. I asked but... Chris to let me know when he gets it. So <laughs> uh, when it's up, I'll put it in the description and you guys can find it there. So if it's perfect. not in the description, it's not up yet. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> perfect, but like, I mean, let's... I'm going to keep picking your brain, Mizu, so I apologize for all the 50 million questions, but... You're good, you're good. I, so Puzzle already mentioned it, the mana base. Like, you, I've seen you play all sorts of... I, I would be here all night talking if I've spoken about all the decks I've seen you play. Um... What do you think about the mana base in a deck like this? <laughs> like uh, the mana base is really nice. Just not completely only having to worry about drawing enough is one of the most comforting things when you're trying to compete in your first tournament. Make like you're trying to pay attention to all the things that you do wrong around, and not having to worry about. Uh, Oh no, I played the wrong land for turn. Really helps. I will say that there was a couple times where I casted a pride and forgot to bounce my Mystic Sanctuary. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, we uh we all make those play mistakes. Um is this your first you know, I actually never asked you this. Was this your first uh competitive online event in CPDH? Yes, it was. Oh, well, it was in fact my first one. Well, double congratulations. Good way to I, start. Good way to start. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, well, uh, there's that's awesome. Literally a message of me saying, "Oh, I'm prepared to go O2 drop, but it's okay because I'm just shaking off my list." Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a. I mean, that's kind of awesome, though, man. Like, it's it's really cool to see, you know you become victorious with this but it you know i really want to touch upon that point of you specifically talking about the mini base there because you're you're saying you not having to worry about that kind of relieves a little bit of stress which is kind of awkward to say right yeah. but it does and as your first event you now get to focus on going why am i countering the spell or do i counter the spell because i mean I'm not going to sit here and count all the counter spells in your deck, but there is a lot. <laughs> if we could be honest, right? Like you are counter to threats. Um, what are you countering? Like, why are you countering certain things with Scholar? Like, tell us, man. Tell us how you play the deck. I, I need to know these things. So the big deal that I find with Scholar is making sure that whatever you keep for interaction, first off, it's more going to be for your own things. Mm -hmm. I don't really mind if a Dargo resolves, as long as the Dargo doesn't kill me. Yep. I can usually combo faster than that Dargo can kill me if I'm paying attention. Mm -hmm. I don't want to counter a Dargo because they'll just recast it. Okay. Um, a lot of the counter spells are, yes, going to be more for your own things, and are going to be there for when you're about to die. You see a Dargo coming at you, you counter the Buccaneer's Bravado. You see that there's a combo deck at the table and they're about to play their last combo piece. You hold the counter for that. Mm -hmm. So it runs a lot of counter magic, but that's just so that you always have one. And I don't really find myself keeping more than one or two pieces. That's fair. Very, very fair. Well, puzzle. What do you what do you got about the deck? Because you know, me and you both being very much blue players. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, to that counterpoint, I think that's like this deck is uh, mono color, 
So it does have to be uh, greedy with its interaction most of the time. And especially since uh, you are capable of winning before you die to Dargo, like you mentioned, I think uh, that's exactly how you should be using the interaction. So I think that was really well put. Like, you can't afford to control the table because you need to be dumping your mana into your cantrips and your draw spells instead of your interaction whenever possible uh, to make sure that you can actually win before you die and not just uh, keep prolonging the game and then you run out of control and somebody else just combos off and uh, wins. But uh, going back to... I just want to point this out. Back to the mana base. Literally the simplest mana base, and we're going to talk about it for 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> how did you feel about your uh, your land count at 33 uh, with your 7 mana commander? So, uh, with the amount of cantrips in the deck, as well as having access to Lorien Revealed, digging and making sure you're hitting your land drops every turn feels a lot smoother. Uh, the only game I had any trouble with my lands were from a really, really greedy keep. I kept a one lander with three two mana rock. And the hand went off the moment I drew a land, and I just didn't draw it. Mm. Yeah, but, it happens. But yeah, mulligan decisions. I, I, I want to run maybe one or two more, test it out because the deck doesn't have an issue with flooding because of those cantrips and those draw spells. And making sure you hit your land drop every turn is extremely important. Yeah. Um, every I land can... drop it becomes two mana. I could see going up maybe one more, but yeah, to anyone. Uh looking at 33 lands and being really scared, I encourage you to look at this deck list and scroll down and look at the mana curve. Because for a 7 mana commander, uh, the curve is extremely low on this deck, which I love to see, obviously. Um, so yeah, I thought that was really neat. So if you guys haven't noticed yet, we're kind of subliminal message mana base mana base <laughs> mana base <laughs> you could kind of tell you know we we like our mana bases here on the common theory if that's not noticeable yet we kind of try to hammer that home and you know this is again another deck that is just look at how smooth and beautiful this mana base is what's wrong with basic lands literally nothing and yeah it's proof is in the pudding so um, one other talking point I wanted to point out was uh, your creature count. Um, talking about like how you were using your interaction, and then looking at your creature count really goes to show just like how much you really need to just hold that interaction for the crucial moments, because you are on six creatures plus your commander. Uh, so yep. if you have anything to uh, discuss in that department, feel free big thing is that most of those creatures are not there for their responsibilities as a creature. Your Academy Wall and Windrider Sphinx are just extra looting every turn or every one of your opponent's turns. Specifically in the case of Windrider Wizard, in a draw engine when you're trying to dig for your extra interaction, help you dig for hide. Uh, anything else? It is more of a detriment that these cards have a power and toughness than it is if they were just an enchantment. Yep, absolutely. Dies to dies to bolt, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, they do. It would be so much better as an enchantment. That's well, how I feel a lot of time with a lot of my creatures in combo decks specifically, obviously. So, so real quick as a caveat, and this is going to be a spoiler alert for you guys if you haven't watched the finals yet, and you probably haven't, right, because it's not out yet. But during the finals, Mizu specifically goes, here's a Peregrine Drake as a, here, please hit this first so I could proceed to win the game. So the Peregrine Drake was just fodder, which kind of shows, like, what Mizu just said, right? Like... I'd rather these cards just be enchantments. Like they're they're just kind of there. So, you know, 
really wanted to touch upon that because you say it. <laughs> it was so fantastic. You're like, are they going to... You guys, no counters? No. I'm good. I can win now. Thanks, guys. Like, <laughs> just great resolves. I guess I, I guess I just win. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So I mean, even if it resolves and gets bolted, right? It's zero mana investment. Uh, yep. As long as it resolves, if it gets countered, uh, yeah, you lose five mana. That kind of sucks. But uh, if it gets bolted, you know, so, because we got their interaction out of the hand. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. But continue. Sorry to interrupt you guys. Uh, I think Drake is the only thing that I care about being a creature because then I can hit it with Ghostly Flicker and this place and all of the different Flicker spells. Yeah, fair. Very fair. Yeah, I mean, imagine if we had an enchantment with Mocking Sprite text, right? Oh. <laughs> Busted. Um, <laughs> we would need to be playing more disenchants. Um oh. We should already be on more just in chance. You should in general, but yeah, if we had these, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely busted. Well, so if you go through, I guess we have to hit this. I didn't really want to talk about this, but since they're able to go through your deck list, what is the one card that you need in the deck, Mizu? Please explain that. Let the audience know. You know, the so card. Very important card that was not put in this list was a copy of Capsize. Uh, Capsize being the three mana instant that bounces something back to its owner's hand with buyback for an extra three mana. Uh, the card is bonkers. It is so good. You have a lot of extra mana lying around because you're a draw-go control deck. Answers a threat on the board that you're facing. It helps get rid of the hardest things to and with the strategy, which is Graveyard Gate. So it turns off most of that for the turn, and it gives you a way to uh, not necessarily win the game, but make it really hard to not lose. I'm not playing it, because I don't own a copy. Yep. yep. That is the only reason. Yep. That mean, is why it's not in the list. <laughs> even in, like, in this deck specifically, it can replace a flicker for your win lights. If you have enough mana, right? You can just go high tide, capsize with buyback on Scholar, cast it, get the high tide back, and high tide like three times, and eventually it'll start netting you mana. Um, if you have any way to like untap your lands or anything like that, um, it's a lot of work because it's six mana and you have to recast your Scholar. But uh, you know, it, it works on rare occasion. But with that said, because um, I know I've seen this come up, actually. There were a few questions in the home base about your list, Mizu, and a few other things. Um, it's actually quite difficult for players to see this deck's win condition. So if I actually don't know much about the format and I'm looking at it, uh, sure, you have infinite everything. How do you win the game? Can you please tell me the cards that literally win the game for you? So there's two main cards that are used to win the game. The first one is Compulsive Research, or any effect that says target player draws. Uh, with your Scholar Loop, you just continue to add back the draw spell and tar start targeting your opponents with it until they draw out of their library, and a player that can't draw from a library will lose the game. Yep. Uh, the line that I went to more often was with the three mana... Artifact, the Hierophant's Chalice. When it enters the battlefield, uh, each opponent loses a life, or target opponent loses a life, and I gain a life. That, in combination with Ghostly Flicker, which is one of the looping pieces that Scholar plays, will drain the entire table over time using that loop. Those are the two big ones. Yep. I mean... That's I it. can't think of another one, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, they have all the cards that repeat the process, right? Like Deep Analysis, all the cards in your deck that could target your opponents that all do the same thing are always win the game. So it's absolutely fantastic. Because that re that'll really help, because a lot of players, I've even had uh, 
people at my LGS here, I showed them your deck list, and they're like, how does it win the game? I'm like, that card says target player? And they're like, oh, target player. <laughs> uh. One note to make about that. Uh, one thing that I hear from a lot of people whenever they hear about that line is, but you're still letting them draw their decks too, right? That doesn't guarantee you can kill them. What if they bolt you in response? I still have infinite resources and instant speed way to get any instant or sorcery back from my graveyard and counter spells. I have infinite counter spells. I can make you draw on the stack in response. I I don't understand why some people uh, think well, that okay. specifically, but... Yeah, it, that's not a concern. You don't care about the drawing interaction at that point. So, to be fair, to be fair, the reason that even became a subject was because in the old times, this doesn't exist anymore, players would just go, I have infinite mana. Now I'm going to try to hit you with sorcery speed cards one at a time. And that interaction would come up. Because they wouldn't draw their deck first or put their graveyard back in their hand. They would just go, I'll draw you out and that kills you. That actually doesn't because you, you should have drawn your deck and put your deck in your hand and be like, look, I'm holding the deck in my hand. You can't do anything just like you said. Now, obviously, we don't exist in that world anymore. So your statement stands. But just like Mizu said, like, there are you would do in the events like i have all of this here's 98 cards <laughs> good luck so another big deal about having capsize is the ability to go i'm going to capsize all of your lands before i make you draw your library yep so exactly. you don't have any advantage at all go to main phase two make sure that there is absolutely yep. nothing MVP that you can that lose to yeah. Yep. Exactly. So it's it's a uh, my favorite. The way I like to describe it is Mortal Kombat flawless victory. Like no one has per. Yes. <laughs> 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 yes. Yes. See. See. This is why we're co-host, right? But um. Yes. But that's why I often found myself going for the Hierophant Chalice line. It's because it straight up kills, and they don't have a chance f to interact with it. Yep. I mean, easy peasy. You smooth brain it. You say this loops a million times. Yeah. You, you, you lose the game. Response. But with all that, I'll loop it again. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, exactly. <laughs> um. With all that said, Misu, please. Any closing thoughts? Anything else you'd like to talk about? Uh, one of the things that I really do want to discuss, and it's something that I've been harping on since I got into even casual play, um, mm -hmm. communicate with the table. Mm. If you don't know what something does, ask other people. If they're your opponents and you're asking about, if, you, if you're player one and you don't know what player four does, but player two and three might, they are your allies in your fight against player four. The uh, enemy of my know. enemy. Yeah. Yeah. The enemy no. of my enemy is my friend, right? Yep. And I'm not talking about in terms of saying, oh, I have this, I have that. I mean, I don't know what player four's deck does. Does anyone know what this deck does? So I know what I need to look for. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um... And that helps a lot when it comes to a format where, like y'all said, it is so wide, it is so expansive. There's all of these decks that people have never seen before. Or if they do, it's in the same tournament that already won a game and you still haven't had a chance to process what it does. Yep. Yeah, I think... Uh... Communication is the best part of multiplayer magic. Use it. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it happen with Heshar... Um, a lot, because obviously that deck has so many lines. Um, even in, like, uh, whatever, how long ago it was, a year and a half, two years ago, when I was playing Gretchen in, like, the budget CEDH tournament, um, 
I played against a Kennen player, and someone else didn't know what the deck did and was like, do we need to be scared? And it was like turn three, and I was like, well, if he has the perfect hand, you know, he can win next turn. And they held up interaction. And then the Kinnon had exactly what I was talking about, and we didn't lose because that person bothered to ask. Because otherwise they're just tapping out, right? Uh, this all loops back, uh, right back to uh, tapping out. Um, but yeah, communicating can now, help you stop misplay. Or yeah. make you misplay, I guess. Now, while that can, uh... <laughs> now, while that can, in fact, uh, bite you back by saying, hey, does anyone have something to answer this? Uh... Does anyone have anything to answer the Dargo player? Oh, you do? Cool, I'm going to use this as a turn to tap out. Yeah. Fair. But most of the time, most of the time, uh, your opponents will be very shady. They don't want to tell you as much information as they probably have. I like to... And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I like to think that we're honest Magic players. I think we all could honestly say the player that lies to you you'll never make a deal with them again right like you'll never have that with them again so the lying player always gets the short end of the stick even in future events because they showed you they lied so I mean, the honest player really helps yeah but it's not always a lie that screws you over i mean like Mizu was saying uh sometimes it is a double-edged sword can you deal with him i've done this in events you have an answer for this, right? Yeah? Okay, uh, tap four. Cast Stone Cedar Hierophant. Um, you have to deal yep. with him. He's gonna win next turn. Hold that interaction. You said you have it. Well, um, it's, that, that's a bit different. <laughs> that, that's not lying. That's yeah, a, it's not a lying. Whole different, but, yeah, uh, that's a whole different kind of thing, right? That'll be on a uh, future uh, episode. <laughs> uh, the point that I was making was you ask if a player has in it has any interaction for someone and there's nothing stopping them from saying I don't want to tell you that information very fair yep or maybe yeah. I don't have it if it's it gets really iffy whenever it's like they have a dispel and they're like maybe it depends on what he actually does um so yeah, yeah, asking about very specific information yeah. like that can be rough, but... The, the phrase I always end up saying in a situation like that is, if it concerns me, I have something for it. But if it doesn't affect me, it's no big deal. Yeah, I like... Uh... The answer for that, Dark. If it comes to me, I do. If it doesn't, I don't. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, like... Like you were mentioning before, it's a lot easier to uh, ask someone if they know something about insert third player than to uh, ask about information from themselves. They're much more likely to give you that information if they know that. Or, you know, like if someone else casts Jutaxian Probe on someone, uh, asking for information from them, probably a good idea, even if they don't answer you. You could get free information by asking, right? Yep. Yep, yep. Well, with yes. all that said... Communication just yes. as important in magic as it is in any other part of the world. Yes. The finalization of this episode, communication is key. Right? We can all agree. Yes. Communication is key. But with that said... Mizu, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure thank to have you. Me. Yes, plug whatever you would like. If you have any, hit us with it now, my bro. Uh, you can always follow me on Twitter at underscore Mizu underscore Sun. Um, I'm in most of the PDH discords. You can at me whenever. Uh, no promises of when I'll get back to you, though. Oh no! Always on this. Uh oh! Uh oh! We <laughs> we 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 lost you on the plug, my bro. We lost you on the plug. Literally went cold turkey. Oh on no! Us. That was so funny. That was so funny. Um, 
yeah, my Twitter is underscore Mizu underscore Sun. I'm also on a lot of the as it goes red as soon as I start plugging. Oh, no. well, we got your wow. Twitter handle. We got that you're on the Discord yes. servers. That's all I need. All we'll right. Put it That's in all the, we need. Yeah, we'll put it in the information below. Guys, follow Mizu if you're not. Don't be like that. Follow him. Jesus. He get, can't even hear him right now. It's just follow it and get it over with already. Puzzle, <laughs> take us home. Take us home. Yeah. Thanks again to Mizu for uh, showing up and having this interview with us. Thank you guys all for watching. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like down below. Comment, let us know your thoughts. Let us know if you're going to start playing Scholar or something. I don't know. Give us the interaction. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. <laughs> and we'll see you all next time. Thank you all for watching.